Hello, this is Mr. Mark, and this is our second video on hydrostatics, or fluids at rest. In this video, we're going to be focusing on the idea of buoyancy, which is often referred to as Archimedes' principle. You may know from history class that Archimedes was a Greek um, scientist, philosopher, mathematician, um, who's most famous for running down the streets of Syracuse naked, dripping wet, screaming Eureka when he discovered the principle that we today call buoyancy. Um, so kind of sort of a big deal. Uh, basically it let him keep his head when he discovered how to solve a problem using buoyancy. We'll talk about that problem in class. Um, but basically the big idea is this. When you take an object and you submerge it in a fluid, like a liquid or a gas, there's going to be an upward force on that object due to the fluid. We call this force the buoyant force, or buoyancy. Um, any object in a fluid is going to have this force. Um, so when you go into a swimming pool and you float, the buoyant force is what makes you float. It's also what makes a helium balloon rise when you let go of it. It's like you go to the doctor, you get a balloon for being a good patient. You go outside, you let go of your balloon, your balloon goes up. In the case of you floating in water, water's the fluid. In the case of the helium balloon, air is the fluid. All objects that are in a fluid have a buoyant force on them. So right now, there is a small buoyant force on you due to the air because you're submerged in the air. I know we don't think about it that way, but it's true. Um, you can find the buoyant force, or kind of feel it, I guess, um, by trying to lift something out of water. You'll feel a difference in the force you have to exert to lift something when it's in water versus out of water. Hauling yourself out of a swimming pool is a good example. It's easy to get about half of you out. You get the rest of you out, it's a little bit more difficult. So, let's kind of dive into this a little bit. Um, the first thing we're going to look at is what causes the buoyant force. So we're just going to consider a simple object that is submerged in water. picture might look like that. The blue is water, the black is the object. Now remember that the water is going to exert pressure on that object due to the weight of the water. It's going to be inward on the object, and it's giving normal to the surface. And so on the sides, the pressure does something like that, pushes inward. Also remember, that the pressure is proportional to the depth of the water. So the deeper you go, the greater the pressure is. And so hopefully you can see that the pressure on the bottom is bigger than the pressure on the top because the bottom is deeper. Remember our equation, pressure is equal to rho g h, bigger h, bigger pressure. And so the side forces balance each other out but the up and down forces are not balanced out. The force on the bottom is greater, and so the net force on this thing is directed upwards. This net force, some of all the forces caused by the water pressure, is what we call the buoyant force. And so buoyancy is just a factor of the pressure being greater as you go farther down in the fluid. So the next question we might want to ask is how big is the buoyant force? So taking the same object, I'm going to ignore the sideway pressures because they balance each other out. We have the pressure on bottom pushing up, pressure on top pushing down. I'm going to kind of label the dimensions. I'm going to say that this object has an area A and a height H. And we can say that the buoyant force is just the difference between the force on the bottom and the force on the top. So we can figure out what those two forces are. That'll tell us how big the buoyant force is. Remember that pressure is force divided by area. So I can find a force if I know an area and I know what the pressure is. And so I'm going to rewrite it like this. I'm going to say that the force due to the water is equal to the pressure on the bottom times the area minus the pressure on top times the area. And we can factor that area out like that. Also remember that pressure is equal to rho gh, where h is the depth and rho is the density of the water. 
And so substituting in it would look like that. And again, we can factor out some of the common terms like that. And so the difference between the heights is simply the height of the uh, object. And so instead of h bottom minus h top, I can just say that's the h of my object. And so get the buoyant force is equal to area times rho times g times the height of the object. And then remember, area times height is volume. And so the density, excuse me, the buoyant force is the density times g times the volume. Now this is a really important place to stop and make sure we've got the right ideas here. In the equation, buoyant force equals rho gv. The rho is the density of the fluid. It's the fluid that causes the pressure, so it's the fluid that's causing the buoyant force. And so make sure you're using the right density. It's the density of the fluid, not the object. The V is the volume of the object that's actually submerged. If part of the object's not submerged, then that part's not going to have any fluid pushing on it, and so it's not going to contribute to the buoyant force. So make sure that we know what things to use there. And so I'm going to kind of rewrite the buoyancy equation more like that. I'm going to always put an F or fluid subscript with the density and always put a submerge or sub subscript with the volume. It's important to make sure we use the right numbers in the equation. The quantity, rho gv, you may recognize from our last lesson, is basically a weight. It's this mass times g because rho times volume is mass. And so the density of the fluid times g times a submerged volume is the weight of the water that would have been there where the object is, but has been displaced. So the object moves some water out of the way. The weight of that water equals the buoyant force. And that's typically how Archimedes' principle is stated. The buoyant force is equal to the weight of the displaced water, or fluid in general. And so Archimedes discovered that when he lowered himself into a bathtub and the bathtub overflowed, at least how the story goes, um, and he realized that he could use this idea to figure out the density of an object. And what he was trying to figure out uh, was how to figure out if a crown that was given to his king was actually made of pure gold or not. The king said, hey Archimedes, tell me if this crown is made out of pure gold, but the catch was he couldn't destroy the crown. Archimedes realized he could use this idea to figure out what the density of the crown was, and thus solved the problem, which is why he ran down the streets of Syracuse, dripping wet naked, screaming Eureka. So, let's look at a simple example. Suppose we wanted to know what the buoyant force on a rather large piece of lead was if it was completely submerged in the water. And so we have a volume for this piece of lead, and we have a density for lead. And so the buoyant force is equal to rho gv. It's important to remember that the rho is the density of the fluid, and that the volume is the volume submerged. Now this thing is submerged in water, so I'm not going to use that 8,000 kilogram per cubic meter. I'm going to use the density of water, which is 1,000 kilogram per cubic meter. The volume, since the whole thing is submerged, the volume submerged is 0.4 cubic meters, just the volume of the object. And so G is 10, our volume submerged is 0.4. So do some multiplying, you get something like 4,000. Your meters cubed cancel out, and so our unit is kilogram times meter per second squared, which you should recognize is a newton, which is our unit for force, so our units work out. We probably did this right. And so our buoyant force is 4,000 newtons. What if 
we ask the same question on the same size piece of ice that is completely submerged in water. What would the difference be? Well, we'd still use our rho GV equation. We've got the same volume. We're completely submerged in water, so we'd use the same density. And so we really don't need to do all this work again. It's the exact same thing as what we did before. The fact that we made it a different object doesn't change the buoyant force because it's still submerged in water and it's still got the same volume. And so both the lead and the ice would have the same buoyant force on them. So it's important to remember the buoyant force depends on the density of the fluid, not the object. So at this point you may be saying, well wait a minute Mr. Mark, are you telling me that ice and lead would do the same thing if we submerged them in water? Obviously the lead would sink and hopefully you realize that the ice would float up to the top. So the thing that we have to remember is that because they have different masses, they're going to have different weights. We haven't thought about the other forces yet. So right now, we've got the buoyant force figured out, but we have to consider the other forces, namely the force of gravity, their weight. So because lead and ice have different densities, they're going to have different weights. And so finding the weight of the lead, we could do m times g, or because we have a volume, it'd probably be better to do rho times v instead of mass. And so multiplying the density by the volume by the mass, by g rather, we give us something like 32,000 newtons. And so this lead submerged in water would experience a small upward buoyant force compared to its weight. And so it's going to end up with a net force going down. Do the same thing for the ice, just a different density. And we'd figure out that the weight of the ice is like 3,680 newtons. So if you compare all those forces, the lead has a big net force going down, so it's going to sink. The ice has a big net force going up, so it's going to float up to the surface. So they have the same buoyant force, but different weights, therefore they're going to behave differently when they're actually submerged in water. So it's important to remember the buoyant force only depends on the properties of the fluid, but the net force is going to depend on both forces. And there could be like three forces. We may have like a rope on our piece of uh, lead or something like that. So just to be clear, when I say force equals rho vg, if we're talking about the buoyant force, that's the density of the fluid and the submerged volume. If we're talking about the weight of an object, that's the density and volume of the object itself. Now those volumes won't necessarily always be the same. For example, Let's suppose we let our ice float all the way up to the top. Question is, what volume of ice will be beneath the surface? And so if you have any experience with ice, like an ice cube, you would know that a, a small part of the ice floats above the surface, but most of it is still below the surface. So let's figure out what is that submerged volume. In the process of doing this, let's remember a couple of steps we're dealing with forces, the first thing we should do is draw a free body diagram. So your free body diagram may look like this. We already know what the weight of the ice is. That's not going to change. Um, but the buoyant force is going to change because it's all not submerged in the water anymore. Second thing we should do, do a net force equation. So you might write a net force equation. Net force equals buoyancy minus weight. Third thing, apply Newton's second law. That's the net force equals mass times acceleration thing. Well, in this case, it's pretty simple because it's at rest. It's floating. Floating means at rest. And so the net force will be zero. And so we can say that the buoyant force and the weight are equal to each other. They add up to zero. They're balanced, in other words.
And so I can solve my buoyancy equation for the, vo the volume of the ice, the submerged volume of the ice. And so that would be the buoyant force over the density of the fluid. Remember, it's the fluid in the buoyancy force equation over G. So if I divide my 3,680 newtons by the density of water and by G, we would get something like 0.368 cubic meters. So remember that the, the um, volume of the ice was 0.4 cubic meters. So what that tells us is that about 92% of the ice is submerged. So 8% sticks up above the water, the other 92% of it is below the surface of the water. You ever heard the saying that most of the iceberg is below the surface? Well, that's why. It's got to do with the density. So try this on your own. See if you can find the submerged volume for the ice if we put it in seawater, which has a slightly higher density of 1030 kilogram per cubic meters. So press pause real quick and just see if you can figure out what the submerged volume would be in that case, and then press play and we'll go through it together. Okay, five seconds was plenty of time. You do the same thing, still equal to the buoyant force over rho g. The force of buoyancy would still be equal to the weight, because it's still at rest. Just use a different density this time. And you get something like 0.357 cubic meters. So just slightly less than when we assumed the water was fresh water. Um, density of salt water being greater means it can exert more pressure with less depth. And so you don't need as much of the ice submerged to make it flow. So here's the thing I want you to think about before class next time. How could you use this concept to measure the density of something? We're going to be measuring both the density of a solid using a known liquid, namely water, and we're also going to be measuring an unknown liquid's density by using a known solid. So this is something that you're going to be asked to come up with during class, how you would actually measure it. Um, your tools would be our standard force measuring tools like spring scales or force sensors and things like that. Just think about how you could use this concept to actually measure the density of something in a lab because that's what we're going to do next time in class. Um, please bring your questions to class as always and I will see you then. Ta-ta!